Dr. Tomi, the wife of uh, Patu Tomi. I, I do some writings, and I know you can't write a book in Nigeria without the cooperation and collaboration of your wife. Please, thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. But as we say in those days, many are called, but few are chosen. I wasn't chosen for the piece. <laughs> But I want to commend you, thank you again for challenging us to look beyond the ordinary. Well, you're a lucky man. When you gather a hall, and that's why you must not get tired, but don't be tired. When you have a hall full of people who have been involved in the struggle, Mr. Fred Agbegbe at 84, and I can see a number of septuagenarians in the hall. Mrs. Medibru, who perhaps looked like a 50-year-old lady. <laughs> Mrs. Maduka, and many of them here who are supporting the struggle for change in our society. You are a lucky man. I, I, I have been, uh, I've been to some uh, three African countries in the last couple of weeks. to deliver lectures on human rights. And human rights in many African countries are different from what you call human rights here. Our president has just graciously appointed six women, or seven, in a cabinet of 43 members. And people are so, wow, we are making progress. We are only two the last time. But please, I beg you, don't think of what they are doing in Europe now. Please, let us be Afrocentric in our thinking. Botswana, no, no, no. Rwanda, South Africa, and Ethiopia have met gender parity. 50% for men and for women. In fact, Rwanda has the highest number of women legislators in the world. So some African countries are trying to fix their problem, practically. Not like us. Some are fighting corruption without making any noise. Not like some countries that are fighting corruption and at the same time appointing corrupt people who are standing trial as cabinet members. I was in the Gambia and the people in that country, 1.9 million people, they are eternally grateful to Nigeria. And I said, why? They said, but for Nigeria, that country will have been fighting a war by now. Because Yaya Jame, after 22 years, was not going to leave power. And it threatened that it would cause a war. Other than recognize the, president, the result of the presidential election. And I asked them, what happened? What did Nigeria do? Two things. The Nigerian president came to town, spoke to uh, Jamet to hand over power. Jamet said, no, OK, no problem. I will also talk to the opposition leader, Barrow, Adama Barrow. So since I'm in a hurry, I will ask him to meet me at the airport. The opposition leader got to the airport. The president asked him to enter his plane to Mali from there to Senegal. That was why his life was saved. Now, but that's not why they are thanking us. They are thanking us because at the stage, the Nigerian Air Force came to town and they flew over the presidential villa. The Yagame abandoned his family and ran to hide in a hospital. And from that hospital, he called the chair of the African Union, I am ready to hand over. <laughs> and that was the end of that battle. <laughs> so they are grateful to us. But that's not where I'm going. I met the Attorney General, the young man. I won two cases at the Echo was called against the Ayajaman. One, a journalist was awarded $100,000 for detention. He was lucky in detention. The other one was tortured for 30 days. He got two hundred thousand dollars from the Echo was called. What are you doing about it, Mr. Fallon? I'm sorry, we're just trying to write you. We believe in the rule of law. We have paid the hundred thousand dollars to the family of 
uh, every mamane, I mean, is 60. And for the $200,000 for Sedika, Musa, we are negotiating with him. He said, wow. He said, why are you surprised? I said, because I'm part of this region. We are many president. Don't, don't obey court orders. The second one, we moved to Senegal. He said, new Senegal. Beautiful, beautiful roads. Uninterrupted electricity of light and water and rest. In the course of our conference, we also went to the old Senegal Dakar. I was a Nigerian in the car, a friend of mine. He said, have you noticed something? He said, no. We have been here for three days. I have not stumbled on a pothole. Madam, representing the government, I think you are listening to me. <laughs> I haven't stumbled on a pothole. I said, yes, I have noticed that. But these things are taken for granted here. He said, well, I do that. This is my first time here. I didn't know there are, there can some, there are some African countries where you don't have portals in their capitals. The third one, we moved to Ghana for a lecture. And as soon as I was winding up my program, I learned the president who was in town, President Nana, Ado Akufo, Akufo Ado. I called him, Your Excellency, I'm in town. I said, what can I do for you? I need to see you in the office. I have a judgment which has not been obeyed by the government of Ghana. He said, no, please come to my office. And I drove to his office. Where is the judgment? And I gave him. His country is a lawyer, by the way. He was Ghana represented in the court. A Nigerian boy, 15-year-old boy, was killed in 2013. Uh, and he got drowned. He was a secondary school student. So the parents came crying. And we went to court. We got to the court that the parents be awarded $250,000. Not that Ghana government, not that the government of Ghana killed the boy, but that the government of Ghana failed to investigate the circumstances of the boy's death. And I gave the judgment to the president. He said, was Ghana represented? He said, yes, by the attorney general. Look at page three, sir. You look at it. We haven't complied. I said, yes, President, uh, the former president, John Mahama, did they comply? He said, okay. I guess God, yes. Okay. There and then he called the attorney general. Send a copy of a judgment to you, and we must comply with the judgment. Right now, the file is in the of They are processing the payment. The point I'm making is have democracy without the rule of law. Nobody is coming to invest in your country without the rule of law. Because when you are anywhere in the world, you will ask if there is a breach of law, will I get justice in that court? Will it be fast and judicious? Now, if you are told you are likely to get judgment, they comply with the judgment. If you are told we are not certain, you will move your money as well. So it's not just enough to say we are disobeying court order. And Attorney General goes to the National Assembly. We are disobeying court order because of national security. I beg your pardon. National security is part of the rule of law. We're not talking of the security of the government. The security of the government is different from the security of the nation. A government may subvert national security, as you saw in the case of Abacha. So I, I want to commend you, my very good friend. I can test, attest to the fact that you are not a terrorist. <laughs> but speaking about the rule of law, which your book is about, and I think you are warning the middle class, I've given up, but I think you are still warning. Now, if we do not do things the right way, if you do not follow the rule of law, revolution is the alternative. Whether anybody likes it or not, whether the people in Abuja likes it or not. We had elections in February, March this year. Over 2,000 people were arrested for violence, for killings in rivers and other places. People were paraded up to now. Not a single person has been charged. 
for any call. South Africa had an election there in June. The following day, all the talks were arrested and their sponsors. So if we do not, if we have a culture of immunity, impunity, we are in trouble. Uh, the Yorubas call immunity. Immunity. You can't arrest him. Immunity. You cannot arrest him. It was Fela that coined that word. It's immunity. You can't arrest him. And that's where we are. Please, let us do a immunity. But, uh, yes, I was the one that told you, if I had informed you, I would have asked you not to go to contesting that. That's true. Because, I mean, three of us here have failed governorship uh, candidate. <laughs> Even our uh, who did the review is safe. Yes. Our friend who did the review is a failed deputy governorship candidate. Pet has just come up, but I tried in 2003 in my poor Ekiti state that I thought was innocent. <laughs> but the day I, I knew I was in trouble, and that was what I was trying to tell Pet. I went out to campaign. I went from village to village. What I call grandings, you know, with my people. It wasn't the normal campaign. I went to communities. What is the problem in this village? What can we do together? It was, you know, <laughs> cross fertilization of ideas. But so what the elite in Adekiti, the state capital, ask me, Mr. Fallon, don't waste your time campaigning. I said, why? Say you are the best candidate. We have seen all of them. Some of them are moderates, some are dropouts. You are the best one there. Yeah? I said, but what do I do? He said, but you know your problem. I said, what is it? You know, they say here that if you become the governor, you will not allow people to steal. I thought it was a honest question. I didn't know it was being cynical. I said, yes. I intend to save money so that there will be money for development. He said, ah, no, that's not what our people want. <laughs> they want the money now so that you can distribute. But if you had advised me, I would have asked you first question. Do you, have you put together about three billion naira? You can't be a governor of a state in Nigeria today without at least three billion naira. Even the smallest of states. Now that you are back, <laughs> don't lose hope. But I beg you, and I warn you the last time, stop investing hope in the elite. I've given up. You must now go to the people. Go and engage in the sensitization of the masses. The elite, we have destroyed our people. Right. We all travel abroad. The moment you land in Dubai or Abu Dhabi or London or even Accra, you are just yourself as a Nigerian. Because you know if you preach the law, you can't beg the police. In fact, that's another offense. Obstruction of justice. A Nigerian travel recently. It was so much in a hurry. He was asking the taxi driver to move. A Nigerian taxi driver, stupid boy, was moving, beating traffic, beat first traffic line. Of course, uh, camera there. Second one, of course, they stopped. Where are you going? They are lying to go. What, what can we do for you? He said, oh, this man is in a hurry. Did you just get to London? Somebody is in a hurry. Listen, they kept them waiting for six hours. This you are in a hurry. This Nigerian man was panting. He then went to them, please, I, I'm, I'm sorry, this boy is stupid, we're in a hurry. Okay, no problem. They charged the driver, and they charged the big man for obstruction of justice. All of us behave ourselves when we travel, but the moment you get back to Murtala Mohammed, you first start by beating the queue, you want to jump the queue. But if you do that in England, they will think you are a mad person. To say you want to jump the where is this one from? They will take you to the psychiatric home. Like Fashola tried to do for those who were driving against the traffic. So my point, sir, it's a wonderful book. It's not likely to be read by many people. No, I'm telling you, our reading culture is terrible now. I mean, somebody did a study recently and discovered that 
read by about 500, 200 people. But when they reported that, some young people had sex in one of these television series, Big Brother or whatever they call it. 170 million Nigerians. Oh, yes. So we're in trouble on all fronts. But you know what we are going to do with this book? And I'm going to beg those who are going to launch or make presentation today. Don't buy one copy, I beg you. Buy copies and distribute. And what I there for? When I give you a book, a copy of a book, I want to know what is in the first chapter or the last chapter. So to monitor that you have read the book, and then we want to discuss it. That's what we want to make a presentation. And the final one, I beg you, all of us should stop demonizing ourselves like the government. You know, a young man was arrested over the weekend, and while he was in detention, while he's still in detention, a lot of information is circulating. Oh, he took money from Dubai. They want to destabilize the country. In fact, one went out this morning. When they were destroying Nepal, there was no revolution. When they were selling Nigeria away, no revolution. Now that they are calling for revolution. Meanwhile, the man who is accused of causing a revolution is in detention. And many Nigerians have asked me, but for me, that young man went too far. How can you be calling for a revolution? I said, where is the offense? You know, since uh, terrorism under what section? Tre treason under what section of the criminal code? I do hope that the government will not charge him. The government will not be stupid to charge children. You know what? He has briefed me. And, no, I'm telling you, in fairness to the SSA, when he told them yesterday, I won't make a statement unless I've spoken to my lawyer. And they say, who is your lawyer? Say for me, father, no. In fairness to them, they, gave, they asked him to phone me. And they gave him a phone. Of course, I knew they were monitoring the phone. And I told him, I hope they won't charge you. But if they do, some of the people in government will be our witnesses. You know why? No, you know why? One of them, I won't mention his name. In 2011, Ask Nigerians to learn from the Egyptian revolution and be ready for a revolution in Nigeria. So it will be my first witness. <laughs> but, but, but please, please, the last one. The late Chief Ganifa Wemi and four other people were charged with treasonable felony by the Ibrahim Babangida Jonathan. I was one of them. We were detained in Kujie prison for, I think, about two months. They then told us one day you are going home, so we're happy. But I told Chief Wawemi, I'm not sure. We're going home yet. So we drove after about 15 minutes from the prison. We were landed in a court and charged with treasonable felony. And what was the offense? I think we didn't even go this far. We, no, I think we, we went beyond children. We pasted thousands of posters and I know printed and pasted across the country. The Bangladesh must go. That was the treasonable felony. So we chant. When we were the two of us who were lawyers, among the five, decided to defend ourselves and our colleagues. When I had to address the court, say, my lord. Section 41 of the Criminal Code states that anyone who forms an detention to remove the president of his office, the, of, the, of the republic, during his time of office, otherwise than by constitutional means, is deemed to have committed treasonable felony and sentenced to prison for, I mean, life imprisonment. But if you levy war, if you levy war, with a view to overrunning the president, you have committed treason. Section 37, death penalty. Say which one? They say treasonable felon. I say, my lord, the president of my country did not have a fixed term of office. Two, he couldn't have been removed by constitutional means because he didn't come to office by constitutional means. They 
Nigeria Forza, this law did not have a military dictator in mind. At that stage, Ghani took over. So my Lord, look at the charge before you. It is odious. And just I'm a chief magistrate. Please. <laughs> The government has filed a charge. You say it's odious. I said, no, my lord. It is frivolous and vexatious. The judge said, please, Ghana, can you come down? I said, my lord, those who should be charged with treason are in the villa. So it is a great irony that those of us who are fighting for change and democracy are the ones facing a trial for treasonable felony. Those who are in power now, harassing Nigeria with treason. Because there is no statute of limitation. Some of them will be tried one day for treason. So if they do not want to provoke, if they do not want to provoke the Nigerian people, to please embrace the rule of law. And for all of us here, I say, oh, they went too far. Oh, the government is right, I beg you. Chapter 4 of the Constitution, which has outlined the fundamental rights of Nigerians, provides. And that chapter is so important. Unlike other provisions, to amend any provision of Chapter 4, you will need three quarters, not two thirds, of the members of the National Assembly before getting two thirds of the State Assembly. Very important. You know what that section says? You cannot abrogate or violate any provision without the procedure permitted by law. So, bankers there, please tell FRS, I want FRS, in the course of collecting taxes, you can't remove my account without my permission or without a court order. Number one. Two. Two. You can't kill a Nigerian, section 33, right to life, without having put him on trial and have been convicted and sentenced to death by a judge. Liberty, in a place like Lagos, if you detain anybody beyond 24 hours, or 48 hours, where you do not have a court within a radius of, of 48, 40 minutes, I mean 40 kilometers, 48 hours. If you are going to detain a Nigerian beyond 48 hours today, you must get a court order, a remand order. If you are going to proscribe an organization, it cannot be by ex-party. You must serve the person. Come and show the court why we should not proscribe you. But you can't do it behind me. It's like getting home today. And I'm told that somebody has gotten a judgment. He's getting me, you know, taking possession of my house. You must hear me. And that is why lawyers say, the right to fear hearing, the practice of that right, Started in the Holy Bible, in the Garden of Eden. Adam, where are thou? God gave him fair yarn. Why did you do that which I asked you not to do? And Adam defended himself. It is the woman. <laughs> so please let us recognize that if you want to violate, and what happened in this case? If the government had the information they are circulating about Shiwore, two weeks ago, these people are planning. For a revolution. What should the government do? Is to approach a court, serve sure, come and justify to the court why we should allow the procession to go on. Do you understand that? Ghana had this independence celebration, I think 2007, 60th anniversary or 50th. And people said, no, we are going to make it impossible for you to celebrate. We have no independence. And they said they were going to demonstrate where you are going to have the independence celebration. The IG, I was in Ghana. I couldn't believe I was in an African country. The IG issued a threat. He filed an application before the Accra High Court to say what? That the demonstrator should not be allowed uh, in an African country. And the judge said, no, we cannot stop them from demonstrating. But what you can do, since you are expecting at least 60 guests, foreign guests at the stadium, we are not going to allow them to have the demonstration in the stadium. But they will go to another part of the city to have their demonstration so that can, they can tell Ghanaian 
Why you are saying we have independent? Allow them to say we have not been dependent. And please, I beg you, when a country gets to a safe, where people are thinking of colonial days with nostalgic feeling, and that's what is going on in our villages. If you go to the rural area, they will tell you, even under the colonial things uh, were not as bad as they are today. It's very bad for us. And that is why, unfortunately, I don't know how to translate this. Last time I was in my village, very risky venture now to go home. You know what I mean? And an old man came to me, Mr. Fallon, well done, oh, please keep it up. But you know, this our independence has become a cause. The way he said it in you, but I don't know how to translate it. He said, Ominira, the water of freedom, has become Ominira. That is, Ominira, water of freedom, has become water of fashion. And that is where we are today. So we are going to use your book to start the remobilization. But let me now tell you what I want to do my own. I'm, I'm starting the launch. Okay. <laughs> I want to launch by assuring you that those names you have mentioned, very risky. And because the reviewer is a lawyer, he didn't mention any of the names. <laughs> but Pat has told me who they are. Let me now assure you that if you are sued, if you are sued for libel by any of them, I will defend you pro bono to give you a thank you.